Assalamu alaikum family It's your brother Greg Hall Spiritually as a Muslim I was born in a place called Camden, New Jersey That's where I became registered And I got my ex As of lately I just wanted to go back home To my spiritual birthplace I wanted to go back home and visit because I've been kind of away for a few years So I'm, we hit the road Hit the road Hit the pavement I tell you, it didn't take long for everything to come back to me once I pulled into the city. The way that that city embraced me, the love that I received from that city, and the wisdom and the understanding is, is just priceless. So as I'm riding, because it is a rough town, Camden, New Jersey is a rough town. It has a reputation for um, just being one of those towns, you know, poor towns. But it has a big heart You know I I pull up to the barbershop the, the mosque used to be Around the corner from a barbershop Brother Ryan and them And we would go in there And we would just build on the teachings And I tell you It's been seven years since I stepped foot In that barbershop But I tell you what We had mosque meeting I wasn't in, I wasn't in the barbershop for three minutes And the mosque meeting started I came here because this this is the town where I first heard the words teach her teach her brother minister teach her so I wanted to speak with someone who's been in this fight, teaching hard. He taught hard under the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and he is currently teaching hard under the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. So who better to sit with? So brothers and sisters, without any further delay, let's give a warm round of applause for brother student minister Omar Kareem of Camden, New Jersey, Muhammad's Mosque, number 20. Those who have a history, and we're just a page in the book. We're not uh, anything other than that. When you're building a nation, all of us are a page. I, I, I might just even just be a footnote, but I'm glad to be that in the nation of Islam. Watching on TV the things with Martin Luther King and the civil rights kinds of activity, and I had an interest in that. I went to march with Martin Luther King in Philadelphia. They were having a boycott and they had invited Martin Luther King. Classic. I mean, I, I don't think anybody, a spokesperson could uh, coordinate words with the supreme capability. I mean, not just exceptional, but the supreme capability of uh, exerting intellectualism in a way that even the, the most common person could see the, hear the big words, but at the same time relate to the metaphoric descriptions that he would give. He was classic in his capabilities. Different from Malcolm, Malcolm was very good at his, the metaphors, the examples, the, the, uh, the pictures that Malcolm could paint. But Martin Luther King could take words and really do fantastic things with, with words. When I walked with Mother of the Kingdom, like I said, I was about 13 or 14, I wasn't conscious. In fact, when my parents found out, when my mother found out that I was even marching with Mother of the Kingdom, because I was marching without, her, without my mom and dad knowing, when she found out, my mom was like, don't ever, you could get killed, you know, out there. So she was not for it. But by the time I reached a teenager and I read this autobiography of Malcolm X, then I became conscious in the movement. After I read his autobiography, then I started getting his tapes. And he, back then we had the real, the real tapes, you know, this goes back a day or two. And uh, I had me, my family had brought me a real, the real recorder. And, and I had Malcolm's album, The Ballad or the Bullet. And man, I used to play it every day. It seemed like all day from the time I got out of school. I think after I read the autobiography, I would say I was probably angry at the autobiography. After I read the autobiography, I was... I was fired up for the inequities 
of our people and in a society that had no concern for our people. When I read his autobiography, I started going to black nationalist meetings. But what ultimately got me interested in or, or turned me into joining the Nation of Islam was that when I was going to the black conscious meetings, I noticed that they were partying, they were impregnating the sisters, they was drinking liquor, and I said to myself, man, we ain't gonna never win no revolution like this. We ain't gonna win no revolution drinking liquor, smoking reefer, uh, uh, impregnating the sisters. And when I seen that, I said, this movement will never create the revolution that I believe that black people were looking for. Ironically, I ran into a brother very conscious brother in the library and he noticed that I was had took an interest in this uh, Malcolm X so he gave me a competition a challenge he says listen you bring me what you know about Malcolm I'll bring you what I know about Elijah Muhammad and let's see whether you would rather be with Malcolm or with Elijah Muhammad and, you know, he gave me a message to the black man, and I began to read. And the more I tried to disprove that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was the man, everything I read validated that he was the man, that he was uh, the servant of God, and that God had taught him in person. I was a 100% convert, and I started going out to the mosque. The strange thing is I had a very strict dad, but when I wanted to join the mosque, I was too young to join without parental consent. I was 17 and you had to be 18 in order to get uh, to join the mosque without parental consent. And so my dad was very strict. Seeing my uh, uh, commitment to it and my dedication to it. And so he agreed to sign, which nobody in my family thought Get my dad to sign. I was like, that's like you had to go get the president to come, <laughs> come sign a form. But my dad signed and let me join. But as time progressed, everybody in my family became black conscious. I started coming to the mosque in 67, and I got my ex in 1968. I got my ex when I was still in high school. The Nation of Islam seemed to be the committed movement. It was where the brothers were committed, they were starched, they were firm, and they were ready to bring about a change. And that was what I wanted. When I joined the mosque, there was only a handful of brothers in the mosque number 12. Mosque number 12, might, we might have had, it might have been 15 of us. I don't even think it was 20. Because you got to remember that mosque number 12 didn't get its number until 1960 under Imam Warfi Muhammad. He came in 58, it was his first ministry, it was Philadelphia. He came in 58 and he ended up going to prison in 60. Malcolm came and dedicated in 1960, number 12. So seven years after Philadelphia got his number, I joined uh, mosque number 12. And most of us were poor because, uh, you know, we came from the, the poor neighborhoods, we came out of the hood. In fact, to the, the show you how poor we were, we go to my first Savior's Day. I went to, a, I got my ex in 68. My first Savior's Day I went to in 1969 to hear the Honorable Muhammad in Chicago. And on that Savior's Day, we went, we went on uh, the bus to go out to Chicago. My suitcase was a brown shopping bag from the supermarket. That's what I took my, <laughs> my clothes out in. And all of us, this was the most popular, all of us mostly stayed at the YMCA uh, in Chicago. YMCA was you know, a popular spot at that time. And we would go out there and it would be several of us, five or six of us staying in a room uh, in Chicago and to come hear the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. None of us had cars. Minister Jeremiah had a, a car, I think he had a Buick, because Mr. Jeremiah came out after Malcolm defected. Malcolm left in 1964. Malcolm left the Nation of Islam. Minister Jeremiah was in Atlanta at that time. After he left, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had him come back to Philadelphia because he was from Philadelphia. But uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had him come back to Philadelphia 
in 60, 64, and Malcolm was end up killed on February 21st, 1965. So a year later, Malcolm was killed and, 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 the, and, and the nation took a big drop because many people felt that the Nation of Islam was responsible for Malcolm's death, so a lot of people didn't come out. The autobiography was utilized to try to create uh, the, the division in the black community because you had nationalists and then you had the Nation of Islam. In fact, they, they felt as if the division could be uh, uh, fanned by making the autobiography mandatory in the colleges. The autobiography became a mandatory reading in the colleges, but ultimately they thought it would be a divisive thing that would turn people against the nation, but actually making people read the autobiography brought more people ultimately to the nation. Mm. But remember now, these a lot of brothers came out of prison. Most people weren't educated in the mosque. Most brothers were, uh, many of them was, were high school dropouts and uh, the few there were. When Martin Luther King was killed, all of us were in an uproar. Even though I was coming in into the nation, and in fact, I was in the nation at the time, but we were all perturbed at a brother preaching peace could be assassinated. So when Martin Luther King was killed, I contacted brothers in Ben Franklin, they contacted me. We turned the schools out. All of Edison came out. We didn't get dismissed by school. We walked out. Mm -hmm. All of Edison walked out. All of Ben Frank. These were two all boys schools. At that time, you had boys. Some schools were all boys and some were all girls. And I walked out of Edison, brought the whole school with me. They came out of Ben Franklin, brought the whole school with them. We merged at Temple University on their campus, went into one of the lecture halls, and I did the main lecture on the history of black people, our black experience, and the history of Malcolm X. I did it on top of a laboratory table in the lecture hall. And Mr. Jeremiah found out about that. I had been in the mosque for about a year, about a year and a half. And Mr. Jeremiah said, brother, you should have told me that the whole time. You know, and then when I told him about it, he then immediately made me a minister. He made me a minister in 1970. I was 19 years old. He said, to his knowledge, I was the youngest minister in the Nation of Islam ever to be over a mosque. Everybody in my mosque was older than me, from my captain, my secretary, my sister captain. After 69, I became so engulfed in my work in the Nation of Islam that I didn't even have the interest in college. I just wanted to see the, the white world come down, and I wanted to be a part of it, bringing it down. So in 69, I came out of college, completed my first year, after I completed my first year, no sooner than I came out in 69, I was drafted. Drafted meant at that time, excuse me, they, they called you in, said that you were being drafted into the, the military service. We were taught to go down for the physical. You know, you go through the whole process and you do everything except join. So I went down and, and uh, took the physical and all of that, and they ran all kind of tests to show you how phony it is. They planned the hearing test. I, I told them I couldn't hear anything. They gave me the sight test. I told them I couldn't read the, I couldn't read, read the words. Regardless of all of that, they still passed me. And so I was then uh, uh, part of the drafting process. So after that, they have... After you do the physical and all that, if they send you past and then they send you, they send you back a letter to tell you come for the swearing in. So I came down for the swearing in. You may have seen it in the movie of Muhammad Ali and they show you how the swearing in goes. I went down for the swearing in. At the swearing in, they said, those of you, you've just been recruited. They asked to tell you what serves Navy, you know, Army, and they call your name out. And then once they say you've been recruited, they tell you to take one step forward. Once you take one step forward at the recruiting office, you are then a member of that military. If you don't take a step forward, then you are considered to be uh, refusing to be drafted. So I didn't take a step forward. So the FBI had me come to the back of the room and let me know that uh, they would be notifying me that uh, there would be a case against me for 
refusing to draft. I could care less because I believe that the white man's time was going to be shorter than my time. So that was my attitude and that's the way I, I felt about it. Minister Jeremiah had recommended a lawyer for me. So we had acquired this uh, lawyer and the lawyer appealed the case based on the Muhammad Ali case. Muhammad Ali case that started I think in 67 and 68, he protested on the fact that he was a minister for the Nation of Islam. I was already an active member, uh, minister in the Nation of Islam. So predicated on his case, the, my lawyer did my case based on the same appeal. So for three years we, we fought the case. In 1973, I was selling Final Call, Oh, Muhammad Speaks at that time, I'm sorry. Muhammad Speaks downtown. Five FBI agents came, me and a brother by the name of James 66X were out selling papers together, which we did almost daily. And the FBI, five FBI agents came and arrested me downtown while I was selling papers. Three in the front, two in the back, and myself in the middle. So they, they arrested me at that time, and my court case began. This is after the, my appeal was denied, and they arrested me, and I, I went to court. At court, I lost the case and was sentenced to five years in prison. Uh, and I was so, you know, not afraid. I was so fired up. I read message to the black man from cover to cover the first night I was in prison from beginning to end, because I, I, love, I love to read. And as, even before I was going, I would read up to 3 o'clock in the morning and so forth. Well, they allowed you to bring books and message the black man, could bring in how they to live. What you could not bring in at that time was the Holy Quran. So they would not let me bring the Holy Quran into the prison. A week I was in isolation in the prison, in the detention center. After that week, then they let me go into population. Population is when you're with all the other prisoners. But for the first week, I was in the isolated uh, cell. My dad was so, you know, so disappointed with the system of what they were doing to his son that I told my dad, I said, Dad, you don't have to worry about coming out to visit me. I'm fine. I'm okay. I'm going to be all right. And my dad was like, how are you? You know, you're in jail and you're talking like everything is going to be fine. No frustration. None. I went, they sent me to Dallas prison. We started FOI class and Sunday meetings in Dallas prison. And the brother who is the, was my captain in Dallas prison ultimately became an imam under the mainstream community, a brother by the name of Wally Bilal. He was my uh, captain in the prison and ultimately came out and became an imam under Imam Warfi Muhammad in latter years. I was the minister and he was the captain. Because if you were from the street, whatever your position was in the street, you automatically became the superior official in the prison. So by me being a minister in the street at the time I was arrested, then it brought me right into ministry, into prison. At that time in the prison, uh, uh, I think they were more happy to have me out than they were in. Because man, we, was, we was just growing by leaps and bounds. They, they would make a request to come down to the meeting. Okay. And then the, the superintendent would give them permission to come down to the meeting. They never refused anybody. You could come down to the meetings and the, and the prison guards would be there. Uh, listening to the lectures and so forth, and I was teaching the white man was the devil, and the prison guards had no problem with it because it was being taught so, with such backing of information, the history of the white man, and where he was born, and how he was made, and how he was grafted, and, and the, uh, the story of his life, to such a degree that many of them were uh, impressed. I was in the, in the prison, man, I could get Fruit, vegetables, all, I mean, everything could come to my, to my cell. Wow. I had a radio in my cell, everything. So it was, you know, for me, it was, it was, it was no, it was no problem. And many other prison guards uh, facilitated. Because you got to remember, the Muslim was also the peacekeeper in the prison. The Muslim was the one that, that stopped the possibility of riots mm -hmm. in the, in the prison. Oh, so man. we were the neutralizing force for violence in the prison. When they served pork, you just didn't eat that, that day. Or you ate, you know, you came down and just ate a fruit, vegetables or something. 
other than a meat, a meat product. And I still never regret going to prison. When I came out of prison and came back to the street, Minister Jeremiah wanted me back in the ministry. So the Nation of Islam was the, was the culture, the civilized angle. And you gotta remember, we were civilizing people who were former gang members. Actually, it was the Nation of Islam that eliminated gangs around the country. Now, let me explain what I mean by that. There were other organizations working with gangs and doing a, doing a, a, a good job. But what eliminated them is that when a gang member, especially in Philadelphia, but it was really true all over the nation, when a gang member joined the Nation of Islam, revenge and retaliation was over. So that killed the, 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 the cycle of you killed my boy, now I gotta come back and kill your boy. You moved on our group, now I'm gonna come back and move your group. But once you joined the nation and you was in a gang, every gang knew ain't no revenge once they joined the nation because they accepted that you was a reformed man and they knew that if they came against you, that we as a group would come against them. And so ultimately, gangs stopped because most of the gang, the greater number of the gang, joined the mosque. Minister Jeremiah didn't take his specialty in his preaching. Minister Jeremiah was a great organizer. He knew how to spot talent and put that talent to work. And that's how we ended up becoming so big. He recruited people who ultimately were gang leaders that ultimately came, and when they came, their whole group came and joined the mosque. So people talk about the time when we were, you know, make, you know, having people get on the buses, and we had the school buses, and we were bringing the people out to the mosque, and many people felt that we was, you know, strong-arming them. But the reality is, the gang leaders had joined the mosque, and when the people in the schoolyard seen them coming off the bus in the nation, suiting, suited and tied, as we may say, suited and booted, the, the, the people knew them. So the people would say, oh, you know, oh, brother, brother John, you know, you in, you in the mosque? Yeah, brother, well, listen, we want y'all to come out to the meeting. And then they would get on the bus. They felt they came out of a town that was influenced with the Caucasian bully environment. So Philly had the, the in my mind, it had the fearless mentality. Give an example how fearless the brothers were. And one time we were going to pick up supplies down in, the, in North Philly and the police stopped us. And I told the brothers, no, get out the car. And the police was like, now didn't I tell you to stay in the car? And I always told the brothers, no, brother, we're going to get, if we're going down, we ain't going down sitting in no car. That's right. If we, if we going down, we going down on our feet. So we got out the car and the police, get back in the car. We didn't get back in the car. The police took his billy club out and was under the impression that he was going to beat us down. Him, he had a partner with him, and partner with him to get us back in the car. Brother, we smashed all the police that came until so many numbers came that they overwhelmed us and, and, and arrested us. But we beat up everything that came out and, and their brothers who are still living as that is a witness to it and the police took us down to the police station and a, and the police officer sitting next to me out of the blue put his hand over my heart and he and he says your heart's not even beating fast you really believe that we're the devil we were in the station not paranoid do what you're gonna do they end up released us, no charges, that's just harassment. No charges and let us go. We went on, picked up the supplies and went on about our business. This was a time of gangs and people coming out of prison. So if you wasn't on the rough edge, you couldn't have survived. So, so much fighting took place in the first building until in the rebuilding, no one's really had to have a fight because the fear of a Muslim was so well established then that people still fear Muslims today who have never been in a fight with a Muslim. But because of the reputation of the first building, people today still accept that Muslims is somebody that you don't want to mess with. And there's dispensations some have had to fight, but not like in the first building, when you know somebody might have been challenging you commonly to a battle. Yep, so we thank Allah. Philadelphia was a, a, a group of, of brothers that had no problem dying for Islam, but more so, if threatened, they had no problem killing for Islam. So if they felt as if the Ambalaj Muhammad was going to be attacked, they had no problem 
defending the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to the death. They didn't mind dying, and they didn't mind killing or be killed if it meant that for the defense of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That was bred into the city of Philadelphia. Philadelphia is just born out of that character. That was the personality of Philadelphia. You know, you take on the nature of the environment that you come out of. And Philly was a big uh, gangster town, white gangster town. And, and, and Philadelphia was out of South Philadelphia that most of these, uh, the mafia ran out of South Philadelphia to the greatest degree. And many of the brothers who were recruited came out of South, South Philadelphia, which was where I was at as well. So they had taken on the character. They weren't gangsters, but they took on the character of the area that they came out of. They admired the mafia because this is who they had seen. They had the money, they had the cars, they had the power, the white mafia that is, and they had the influence. So the brothers who joined came out of that mindset. They didn't create it. They just were a victim of it. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad basically only came out once a year, and that was for Savior's Day. Savior's Day is when you've seen the Honorable Elijah Muhammad from 69 to 74 was the last time the Honorable Elijah Muhammad did the Savior's Day in 75, Amen. Wharf did it. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad we would see once a year, but all of what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad taught was taught to all of us by the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. He was the national spokesman for the Honorable Elijah Muhammad on the broadcast. He's a national representative, but on the, on the, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had a radio program that broadcast once a week. And Minister Farrakhan was the voice of that broadcast. Oh. So Minister Farrakhan was actually the presence for all of us of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. So every week, you couldn't wait to tune in to Minister Farrakhan, because I mean, he could blast. And we would just turn our radios on, bam, to hit a minister, Minister Farrakhan on the radio. And then if you wanted your city to have a huge audience, you had to invite Minister Farrakhan. So you invited Mr. Farrakhan, then you got your biggest audience. Dang it, that no, at that time it was popular to be in the nation. The nation had gotten so big, it had became the fad. Joining the nation was the end thing to do. And that hurt us. It helped us and hurt us, but it hurt us as much as it helped us. Because once something becomes a fad, people join it because it's popular, but they don't join it because they're knowledgeable. So many people were joining, but they weren't really knowledgeable about Islam. They weren't studying, they weren't being as learned as we were early on, because early on people were arguing with you all the time. You believe God is a man? You know, you believe he talked to God in person? You believe he's the messenger of, of God? So you were arguing all the time with someone. But in the latter time, no one was arguing because we were so, you know, our numbers were so huge. And that from 70 on, we began to we begin to grow. I mean, it's growing so big. This is when Minister Farrakhan had to be helicoptered into Randall's Island just to teach a lecture because there was so much traffic that he couldn't even get in. 70,000 people came out to hear him preach. There was such a dynamic yeah. then and, and now. I mean, there's, 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 there's never been anyone second to the minister's skill. You know, Martin Luther King was great with his words. Malcolm was great with his metaphors. But the minister just had that persuasive, intellectual. He was just the combination of all of it combined. Wise, he was intellectual, he was descriptive, he could paint a picture, and his delivery was just without, without equal, as it is now, without question. To the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, I take honor in being a student. Some say they're ministers. I'm not a minister. I'm a student under a great minister and a man who's so much more. We call him the divine reminder and the divine warner in our midst. But when a man gives his mind over so totally to God that when you see him, it's like the story that Jesus talked about. When you see him, you're looking at the Father. Because he's in the Father, and the Father is truly in him. And it's my gratitude to be a student at the foot of such a luminary, of such a servant of God, such a manifestation of the will of God. If I can be no more than at least 
a grain of sand on the desert. I want to be a grain of sand that will sparkle for the glory of a mighty God and his servant, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I thank you. I salam alaikum. So we thank Allah for patience and perseverance so that we can see the yielding of a new day and a new experience. So I am grateful to have had a chance to just go through a few things and maybe sometime in the imminent future we may do it again. Thank you. And I the laws of God there.